Hello Grade 11s and welcome back to this series on Newton's Laws of Motion. In this lesson, we will look at Newton's second law of motion. So far, we looked at what happens when the forces on an object are in equilibrium or the resultant force is equal to zero. An object remains at rest or travels at a constant velocity. In this lesson, we will investigate what happens to an object when there is an unbalanced force acting on it. Newton's second law explains what happens to the motion of the object. But before we start our investigation of Newton's second law, let's cross over to Nelly to analyze the experiment with the balls traveling at different velocities. In this experiment, a thin piece of cardboard was able to stop a slow-moving ball but not a faster-moving ball. A thicker piece of cardboard was required to stop the faster moving ball. What can you conclude about momentum and velocity? I'm sure you'll agree that we should be able to check your answers by testing the amount of force required to stop the ball in each scenario. Do you think we could test the force using apparatus similar to those we used to test the force required to stop the heavy truck and the lighter passenger car? Let's check it out with Aaron in the lab. This time we keep the mass of the car constant at 250 grams. We change only its velocity. So I'm going to use the same vehicle, just let it hit with different velocities. First we measure the force as it strikes the barrier with a low velocity. And then we let it strike with a high velocity. Do you see that it takes much more force to stop the faster moving car than it does to stop the slower car? It would therefore seem that the car with the greater velocity has greater momentum. I'm sure you can agree with me that we can apply the same principle to the ball. Thanks, Aaron. Let's just quickly summarize the conclusions of this experiment. A small force, such as that applied by the thin cardboard, only stops the ball with a low velocity. The thick cardboard applies a greater force and the ball with a greater velocity can also be stopped. The results of the experiment highlight important road safety aspects. Let's cross over to Nelly again to recap what you've learned about Newton's first law and road safety. The Road Safety Act states that all passengers in a car should wear their safety belts. Why do you think this is? Do you think that what you have learned so far about forces and bodies in motion can help you answer this question? Imagine what would happen if you weren't wearing a safety belt in this accident. It is quite clear that if you don't wear a safety belt, you stand a good chance of being seriously injured when a car stops suddenly. But why does the force that stops the car not also stop the passenger? Let's consider Newton's first law again. Newton's first law of motion tells us that a body remains at rest or moves with constant velocity in a straight line unless a resultant force acts on it. When the car hits the barrier, the bearer exerts a force on the car and the car exerts a force on the barrier. The resultant force causes the car to stop suddenly. Notice that the interacting bodies here are the car and the barrier. There is no resultant force acting on the passenger. Therefore, according to Newton's first law, the passenger keeps moving. He continues moving forward at the same speed and in the same direction until a resultant force acts on him. Unfortunately, this normally happens when the passenger's head collides with the windscreen. This impact can be fatal or it can cause very serious head injuries. To make sure that you truly understand this application of Newton's first law, let's look at another example. I've placed a coin onto a stiff piece of cardboard. Look at what happens when I flick the cardboard horizontally. Do you see that the coin remains in the same place as the cardboard flies away? Can you explain how this happens? The coin remains at rest because there is no resultant force acting on it. The cardboard, however, flies away when I flick it. The resultant force was applied only to the cardboard, not to the coin. So the inertia, in other words, that property of the coin that resists a change in its motion, kept it stationary, that is, at rest. Now in our previous lessons, we've established that all bodies in motion also have a property called momentum. In addition, we've discovered that a body's momentum will only change when a resultant force acts on it. This is a confirmation of Newton's law. 
So now let's move on to look at Newton's second law. Think about the following question carefully and discuss what you think with your classmates. When you apply a force to a ball over a period of time, what happens to the ball? By the end of this lesson, you should be able to answer this question. Let's cross over to Nelly to begin our investigation. I would like us to start our investigation by looking at an interesting puzzle. Let's see if Dineo and her friends can help us with it. Hi Nelly, we've got Tandy standing by with two eggs needed for this part of the puzzle. Tandy has two raw eggs in her hands. First, she's going to drop one of the eggs from a height of 1,5 meters onto a tabletop. Clearly, the resultant force that the table exerted on the egg quickly changed the egg's momentum to zero. Correct, Dineo, but what do you think will happen if you guys try the same thing with a linen sheet held in place instead of the table? Why don't you give it a go? Once again, we get Tandy to drop a raw egg from a height of 1,5 meters. Look, Nelly, the egg doesn't break this time. The sheet saved it. Tandy, won't you drop that same egg onto the tabletop just so that we know you're not cheating and using a boiled egg? And there you go. It breaks. What saves the egg? The egg traveled at exactly the same velocity when it hit the tabletop as it did when it hit the sheet because it has fallen from exactly the same height in both cases. Therefore, the change in momentum is the same in both cases. So what is it that is different? Do you agree that we would have to say that the resultant force exerted by the sheet on the egg was somehow less than that of the tabletop? But why? Let's look at the demonstration again, but this time in super slow motion. On replay, you should be able to see that when the egg smashed into the tabletop, it came to a stop quicker than it did when it fell onto the sheet. In other words, the contact time between the table and the egg is shorter than the contact time between the egg and the sheet. Notice that Nelly described what happened to the egg dropped onto the table and the egg dropped onto the sheet in terms of change of momentum. When Isaac Newton formulated his second law, he described it in terms of a rate of change in momentum. You will learn more about this in grade 12. When the force is applied to the egg, the momentum changes because the velocity changes. The mass does not change. It remains constant. Nelly explained how the contact time for the egg that landed on the table and the egg that landed on the sheet were different. In each case, the rate of change of velocity was different. Now, remember that rate of change means we divide the change in velocity by the change in time. This equation is how Newton described his second law in terms of the rate of change of momentum. But you should remember from your study of motion in grade 10 that the rate of change of velocity is acceleration. So from this, Newton's second law can be described in terms of the acceleration of an object when a force is applied. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. The resultant force is equal to the mass of the body times its acceleration. And this does make good sense. We already know that when a resultant force acts on a body, it causes it to either increase its velocity or to decrease its velocity. When the velocity of a body changes, we say that it is accelerating. The resultant force accelerates the body in the same direction as the resultant force. But how is the acceleration of the body related to the resultant force? To answer this question, we rearrange the relationship, making the acceleration A the subject of the formula. This tells us that the acceleration is directly proportional to the resultant force, and it is in the same direction as the force and the acceleration is inversely proportional to the mass of the body. Newton's second law of motion is often stated in this way, in terms of the acceleration of the body and its relationship to the resultant force and the mass of the body. Why don't we see if we can confirm this relationship in the lab? Hey there guys, now look here, I've got a little car and a friction compensated track. Now what that means is that our track has got so small frictional force that we can ignore it during our calculations. And the track has been designed in such a way that our car can run down it at constant speed. 
We can check this by attaching a ticker tape to the trolley and letting it run on the track. Do you see that the displacement of the trolley over equal time intervals is the same? This tells us that the car travels at constant velocity. Now I'm going to attach this weight onto the car using the slide string. Now the slide string is designed in such a way that it doesn't stretch when I attach a weight to it. Now the weight hangs over this frictionless pulley and it pulls the trolley along the track. The trolley accelerates when the weight is attached to it. We can see this by analyzing the ticker tape. Now our analysis will also tell us about the rate of acceleration. The displacement increases in equal time intervals. We can see that there's a constant rate of increase in displacement in each of these time intervals. So the acceleration of the car is uniform. Now we're going to use this apparatus to verify Newton's second law of motion. Firstly, we need to measure the acceleration of the trolley as we change the resultant force applied. The independent variable is the resultant force. Acceleration depends on the force, so acceleration is the dependent variable. To make this a fair test, we must make sure that our system mass is constant. Let's begin by loading up the mass to achieve our maximum resultant force. Now let's release the car, but remember, be careful not to let the weight hit the floor before the car completes its run. Now we must analyze this tape and label the force we used as 2,5 Newton. Next, we're going to change the resultant force and let the car run again four times. Now, what I'm going to do in each run, I'm going to take one mess piece off the weight, put it onto the car. Now, that reduces the resultant force, but it makes sure that the mass of the system is constant, and it ensures that this is a fair test. Well, Nelly, I think we've got enough data for you to analyze. Thanks, Aaron. Let's draw a graph using the data Aaron collected in the lab. When the results are plotted on a graph, we can see that as the resultant force increased, so did the acceleration. In other words, the acceleration is directly proportional to the resultant force and in the same direction as this force. Do you think we can use the same setup of apparatus to verify the relationship between the acceleration and mass of the trolley? Think about it. If we keep the resultant force constant and change the mass of the trolley, we should be able to do it. So we begin by accelerating the trolley using the force which we have on it now. Collect the tape and analyze it. Then we take off one of the mass pieces and repeat the trolley run with the same resultant force applied. If we graph these results with mass as the independent variable and acceleration as the dependent variable, the graph shows us that as the mass increases, the acceleration decreases. It seems to have the shape of a hyperbola. But to check that the results truly give us an inverse relationship, we must plot a graph of acceleration as the dependent variable and the inverse of mass, 1 over mass, as the independent variable. So we have proved in our experiment that the acceleration is proportional to the force applied and inversely proportional to the mass of the object. 
Next time, we will look at how to apply Newton's second law to various situations. So you need to revise how to resolve forces into components and how to draw force diagrams. Remember to refer to the task video for this series and visit the Mindset website, www.mindset.co.za forward slash learn. Goodbye for now. Great 11th.